One of my wife's absolute favorite family stories is about our nephew James. One year, our whole extended family got together for Thanksgiving up in North Georgia. And on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, we went into town and poked around for the afternoon. And James was all of 18 months old. So he gets tired, and his mom picks him up as we're walking, and is carrying him. And we pass another mama holding her baby, who is probably a few months old. And James, with this air of superior, superiority, looks at that baby and goes, Baby! Wah, wah, wah! Because James knew he was so much bigger and cooler than that little baby. Well, then we get in the car and we drive a half hour to dinner. And James lost his mind crying. And why? Who knows? James didn't even know. The best reason is because James was still pretty much a baby. Well, in our passage today in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is having to point out a very similar message to this church. He says he could not address them as spiritual people, but rather as infants in Christ. And they're still, after years of discipleship, merely infants, only capable of baby food. And this is the first thing we need to realize from this chapter. Paul is responding to a claim made by this church that they're a highly spiritual and mature people. And Paul has to make a clear rebuke here. Just because you can point to people who know less than you know. If at the end of the day, you boast at your own spiritual prowess and look down on one another. If at the end of the day, your individual and community life doesn't really look any different from the rest of Corinth. Well, then you're not a mature spiritual Christian church. There's a self-deception in this spiritual infancy that we need to be aware of. My son Luke, who's eight months old, thinks that he can crawl. He can move backwards. So he's learned to get into a crawl stance and push backwards. And he's kind of blindly moving around the living room. It's this pseudo crawling. Well, imagine adults doing that. Imagine adults walking backwards or driving backwards. It's not the same thing, is it? It's dangerous. And you can't get to where you're trying to go. There seems to be a similar self-deception and blindness in the Corinthian church. They think that they're mature, and on a scale of 0 to 10, they're feeling like a 10. They're clearly not. But they're also blind to the fact that their arrogance their poor witness doesn't make them fives. It actually seems like they're still at zero. And in fact, after years of discipleship, the damage that they're doing inside the church, notably to the poor, the damage they're doing to the witness of the gospel outside of the church seems to bump them even into the negatives. And I'm not using these numbers as a grade of achievement, but rather distance on a spectrum of growth in a certain direction. Paul's clear that the achievement, the grade, the merit, all goes to God, right? He says that God is the one who brings the growth. But we are called to cooperate with him, not to ignore him, not to thwart him. And in fact, that's actually the theological definition of scandal. Scandal's not bad press in the media. It's risking souls. And if we ignore God, if we thwart God's work, if we harm others in the church, or if we live a life that's a farce and embarrasses Christ crucified, well, we risk people never coming in to the community of the faithful. And we risk people leaving. And that is scandal. That's pseudo-Christianity. It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously, famously called a gospel of cheap grace. A grace that doesn't change us and that doesn't compel anyone. 
And that's one of Paul's chief concerns with the Corinthians. Paul is pointing us to the futility and scandal of the wisdom of the world. Father David preached on that last Sunday. And the passage we read in our community groups this week from chapter 2 said that we as the church have the mind of Christ. That's a phenomenal claim. Not just that we know Christ, which on its own is amazing, that we can know God. But further than that, we have the mind of Christ. There's a sense in that we are transformed into Christ. We're not simply for Christ. We're not simply with Christ. We're in Christ. We are in Christ. I think a good way to think about this is a sports jersey. I went to the University of Florida, and I I made a whole of two Gator games in my four years there. So I'm not a very good fan, but I Googled this morning, and apparently they won last night against someone, which is great. If I were in the stadium wearing a Gator jersey last night and said, we won, that would probably be pretty different from the guys on the field last night saying, we won, right? They have a very different understanding of that. Because I'm wearing a jersey that means I'm for them, I'm with them. But when they're wearing that jersey, that jersey is a symbol of who they are. They are the Florida Gators. And if I'm walking around town in any other clothes, no one's going to see me and identify me as a gator. But when those athletes walk around Gainesville in any other clothes, everyone associates them as the gators because they are the gators. We live in a world today in which identity is a big buzzword. We hear this all the time, and it's a big deal for us. People talk about the layers of our identity. I'm a white, married, millennial, second-generation Italian, Irish, American male. And I'm not knocking the importance of the identity conversation. I think it is important. And I'm not denying that all those things are true about me. But I do believe that none of them can function as my core identity. Once we are baptized, our identity is in Christ in the church. And Paul says in our reading today, we, all of us together, are God's field. We are his building. We are the temple of his Holy Spirit. That's another phenomenal claim. That's not a metaphor. Paul is saying that we are the temple where God's Spirit has chosen to live. And we have to guard against reading this as individuals. It's not as if we're all a bunch of mini temples floating around. When Paul says you throughout this letter, he's meaning y'all, all of us. You know, the founding dean of Beeson Seminary up in Birmingham, very close to here, wrote recently about the devastating effect of radical individualism on the American church. And he says that the priesthood of all believers that Martin Luther championed at the Reformation, the idea that in baptism, all Christians enter into a general priesthood, this has morphed into a common distortion. We often hear today the priesthood of the believer, right? This subtle shift from all believers to the believer. It reflects a shift in modern Christianity that makes room for me to practice my own faith in my own life in my own way. And that's fundamentally unbiblical. Paul makes it clear our identity, like the athlete wearing the jersey, is a community identity. I cannot just be a Christian in my general priesthood at home, never going to church, practicing my own flavor of spirituality. That's not how it works. To be a Christian necessarily means to be incorporated into the people of God, into the temple of the Holy Spirit, which we call the church. And the Greek word for church is ekklesia. It means the ones called out. The church is the people called out of the world. We're likewise the people called out of ourselves called out of radical individualism. 
And as Paul said earlier in this letter, we're called together to be saints. This is important because I want us to reflect on this idea of the general priesthood of all believers. In addition to Martin Luther, the Roman Catholic Church also highlighted this principle at the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s in a document called The Light to the Nations. And in that document, there's a chapter called The People of God. And the people of God, in their general priesthood, the council says, live in domestic churches. I'm going to modify that a little bit and call them domestic parishes, to use our Anglican word. The domestic parish is your home, it's your family, it's your life. This is the place where we all exercise that general priesthood. It's the place where God has called you to lead, to teach, to evangelize, to pray, and in all things to glorify God. It's where you're called to build on the foundation of Christ crucified that Paul tells us he has laid. Our homes, our families, our daily lives are where every Christian builds up the church. And this is the work that Paul tells us will be tested by fire on the day of the Lord. But because you're not just an individual, you're a member of a community, because the church is one, your domestic parish is not just your church. It's built on Trinity Anglican Church which is built on the Gulf Atlantic Diocese, which is built on the Anglican Church in North America, which is built on global Anglicanism, which is built on the historic universal church of all Christians in all places for all time, which is ultimately built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So I want you to think about your home and your life in these terms. You're a church planter commissioned by Trinity Anglican Church. You're a church leader. And to that end, Paul is talking to you in this letter this morning. A good friend of mine is a pastor of discipleship at a very large church. And we were talking one day about church barbecues. And he said, you know, a church barbecue is a perfectly fine discipleship event. But the question becomes this. What is the difference between a neighborhood barbecue and a discipleship barbecue? How is that barbecue building up the body of Christ and glorifying God? That becomes the first question when you're scheduling a church barbecue. I think we have to ask that question about our domestic parishes in our homes and lives. What does leisure time look like? What is work? look like? What does going to the grocery store look like? In the same way that we hold the church accountable for its budget and the way it spends money, what if you looked at your home budget as a church budget that was in your pastoral care? Not just the portion you give to the church, but your whole budget. These two ideas, the priesthood of all believers and the domestic parish, prevent us from thinking about Trinity Anglican Church as the place where we're Christians living out Scripture's teachings. And they prevent us from thinking about Sunday morning as the time when we're at church. They force us to heed Paul's teaching in all places and all times in our daily lives. And to ignore that becomes very short-sighted. Because if we look back at verse 13... In your bulletin, Paul writes, Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. One theologian wrote about this verse, saying, On that day, we will come to realize just how much of our lives were spent in activity of no eternal value. Remember, Paul says we are building the church, the temple of God's presence. 
And if we're building, then each of us has to train to become a builder through worship, through prayer, through study, through practice. And as we truly grow in spiritual maturity, we'll become better builders, better general priests. And Paul speaks in no uncertain terms that we will be judged by the quality of our work. Poor work will be consumed and cast away as useless. Faithful quality work will be rewarded. Now, the reward's not salvation. That comes by grace, even to the poor builder. But Paul does say there is judgment and reward for our work as Christians. And he's echoing the teaching of the prophets and of Jesus in that. A vivid way to paraphrase this warning Paul gives us this morning might be this. If Jesus came to the temple that we're building, would he worship and glorify the Father? Or would he turn over tables and feel a need to cleanse the temple? We have to ask that about our lives and our homes and our families. We have to ask that about Trinity Anglican Church. We have to ask that about Anglicanism. We have to ask that about the Christian community here in Thomasville. Are we divided? Are we arrogant? Are we building a temple for God's presence that will withstand the test to come? Now, the good news is that we don't have to figure this out on our own, how to heal and to grow. Remember, we're made free to let go of foolish wisdom of the world. We have the mind of Christ, and we can claim the mind of Christ, the wisdom of God. And when we are faithful, God takes care of the growth. That's the promise. As we continue our 1 Corinthians series this fall, I want to encourage you to come to the Wednesday night teachings and suppers and to join a community group, because it's through all of those events that we'll be studying this whole letter. And this whole letter in its entirety will throw light on all of our lives in different ways. It'll throw light on our life as a family together. It'll challenge us with hard questions. It'll redirect us. But the promise is that we will grow in unity and grow with God both here at Trinity Anglican Church and in our little domestic parishes scattered all over Thomasville. And thank God for that promise. Amen.